On the occasion of the publication in March 1987 of the Catholic Church's condemnation of in vitro fertilization, surrogate motherhood, and fetal experimentation, there appeared a cartoon in a Roman newspaper in which two bishops are standing next to a telescope. In the distant night sky, in addition to Saturn and the moon, there are dozens of test tubes. One bishop turns to the other who is in front of the telescope and asks, this time, what should we do? Should we look or not? The historical reference to Galileo was clear. In fact, at a press conference at the Vatican, Cardinal Ratzinger was asked whether he thought the church's response to the new biology would result in another Galileo affair. The cardinal smiled, perhaps realizing the persistent power, at least in the popular imagination, of the story of Galileo's encounter with the Inquisition more than 350 years before. The Vatican office, which Cardinal Ratzinger now heads, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, is the direct successor to the Holy Roman and Universal Inquisition. In my initial lecture, I sought to provide a global view of the Galileo affair, paying special attention to the persistence of the legend of Galileo's encounter with the Inquisition, a legend which sees Galileo as representing modern science's fighting to free itself from the clutches of biblical, liberal, li biblical literalism, blind faith, and superstition. I argued that Galileo and the, and the officials of the Inquisition shared common first principles about the nature of scientific truth and the complementarity between science and religion. In this lecture and the next two, I want to examine with you some of the particulars of this famous story in order to suggest an interpretation quite at variance with the popular legend. Galileo was born in Pisa in 1564, the same year in which Michelangelo died and Shakespeare was born. It was 21 years after the publication of Copernicus's treatise on heliocentric astronomy, 47 years after the appearance of Luther's 95 Theses and the beginning of the Reformation. In fact, the Protestant Reformation, the Catholic response, especially the Council of Trent, whose final session ended in 1563, the destruction of the religious unity of Europe, and the ensuing wars of religion constitute the world in which Galileo will spend his entire life. Galileo entered the University of Pisa in 1581 to prepare for a career in medicine, but his interest quickly turned to natural philosophy and mathematics. After teaching at Pisa for a few years, he left in 1592 for the University of Padua. It was at Padua from 1592 to 1610 that he formulated the basic principles of his physics, especially his understanding of the laws of motion. In 1609, he began to use the newly discovered telescope to observe the heavens. And in March 1610, he published The Starry Messenger, in which he reported his discoveries that the Milky Way consists of innumerable stars, that the moon has mountains, and that Jupiter has four satellites. Subsequently, he discovered the phases of Venus and spots on the surface of the sun. He named the moons of Jupiter the Medicean stars and was rewarded by Cosimo de Medici, Grand Duke of Tuscany, with appointment as chief mathematician and philosopher at the Duke's court in Florence. In order to understand the importance of Galileo's starry messenger, we need to place his observations in the context of developments in astronomy in the late 16th and early 17th centuries. Between 1572 and 1610, there were several new observations. The Nova of 1572, Tycho Brahe's observations, and those of others as well, of comets in 1577 and 1585, the supernova of 1604, and Galileo's own observations in 1609 and 1610. These observations persuaded several natural philosophers that some important features of the heavens described by Aristotle could no longer be accepted as accurate, in particular the immutability of the heavens and the existence of solid crystalline planetary spheres. Also, as I noted in my first lecture, Galileo did not think 
that his telescopic discoveries provided a proof for the view that the Earth rotated on its axis and revolved about the Sun. He did think that they provided arguments for the plausibility of Copernican astronomy. His discovery of the phases of Venus required only that Venus must revolve about the Sun. Even the discovery of spots on the Sun and the fact that these spots moved across the Sun's surface only provided evidence that the Sun was not an immutable body. None of Galileo's telescopic discoveries required the abandonment of a modified geocentric system. Much less did they affirm the truth of a heliocentric one. Furthermore, Galileo understood the difference between providing plausible arguments for a position and demonstrating that it is true. Although Galileo's telescopic observations were not sufficient to demonstrate the truth of Copernican astronomy, they did serve to call into question the received geocentric cosmology, which was a melange of views having their source in Ptolemy and Aristotle. They were also a powerful impetus for Galileo to discover a demonstration for the motion of the Earth. In The Starry Messenger, Galileo claimed that his most important discovery was the four moons of Jupiter. According to Galileo, this discovery, and here I quote from The Starry Messenger, this discovery of the four moons provides an excellent and splendid argument for taking away the scruples of those who, while tolerating with equanimity the revolution of the planets around the sun in the Copernican system, are so disturbed by the attendance of one moon around the earth while the two together complete the annual orb around the sun, that they conclude that this, the Copernican constitution of the universe, must be overthrown as impossible. For here, with the discovery of the moons of Jupiter, for here we have not only one planet revolving around another, while both run through a great circle around the sun, but our vision offers us four, wanderings, four stars wandering around Jupiter like the moon around the earth, while all together with Jupiter traverse a great circle around the sun in the space of 12 years. Copernican astronomy required two centers of heavenly motion, the moons revolving around the Earth and the Earth and the other planets revolving around the Sun. Yet such a universe with more than one center of motion seemed inconceivable. Since, as a result of Galileo's discoveries, it was now clear that four moons revolved around Jupiter and Jupiter itself moved around another center, an important objection to Copernican astronomy disappears. How could any thinking person not accept the new heavens, the Novita Celeste, to which Galileo had drawn attention? Stillman Drake, one of the famous scholars of Galileo in our own age, categorizes the opposition to Galileo in the following way, and I quote from Stillman Drake. The arguments brought forth against Galileo's new discoveries were so silly that it's hard for the modern mind to take them seriously. The chief argument was that the phenomena he had described were merely illusions created by his telescope and had no real existence in the skies. One of his opponents who admitted that the surface of the moon looked quite rugged maintained that it was actually quite smooth and spherical as Aristotle had said reconciling the two ideas by saying that the moon was covered with a smooth and transparent material through which the rugged surface could be discerned. One after another, all attempts to cleanse the heavens of new celestial bodies came to grief. Philosophers had come up against a set of facts which their theories were unable to explain. The more persistent and determined adversaries of Galileo had to give up arguing and resort to threats. End of quotation. Were the objections to Galileo's claims all so silly, as Drake calls them? Galileo argued that his new optical device revealed things in the heavens as they really were, even though they were invisible to the naked eye. Galileo provided no theoretical arguments in the science of optics to demonstrate the reliability of the instrument he had used. In this respect, it's useful to cite the remarks of the philosopher and historian of science, Hans Blumenberg, who warns us against an all too easy dismissal of Galileo's opponents. It's a quotation from Blumenberg. 
the fool's role that Galileo's opponents have long played in the historiography of natural science has rendered them harmless for us and obscured their significance as indicators of the difficulties in our relation to reality that are always present and become especially acute in historical situations where radical change is underway. The failure of their obstructed faculty of vision is only a correlate of the exaggerated expectations that Galileo himself had invested in his optical discoveries." End of quotation. In an intriguing recent article, Roger Ario, historian and philosopher of science, notes that Galileo's arguments for there being mountains on the moon presupposes that the moon reflects light from the sun. But to assume that the moon reflects light is to assume that the surface of the moon is rough and uneven. To assume, that is, that the moon is like the Earth. In this regard, it's interesting to note that medieval natural philosophers rejected the view that the moon reflected light because a smooth and polished surface, which they were convinced the moon was, would function like a mirror and reflect light light rays in a way other than from a rough surface. surface. That is, the whole surface would not reflect light equally. Thus, medieval natural philosophers thought that the, that the moon receives light from the sun, becomes luminescent, and then light emanates from it. The medieval Muslim philosopher Averroes is a principal source of this view. And here I have a quotation from Averroes on this subject. He writes, it has been demonstrated that if the moon acquires the power of lighting up from the sun, it is not by reflection. If it illuminates, it is by becoming a luminous body itself. The sun renders the moon luminescent first, and then the light emanates from it in the same way that it emanates from the other stars. That is, an infinite multitude of rays are issued from each point of the moon. If its power of illumination issued from reflection, it would illuminate some determined places on Earth depending upon its circumstances. Reflection is produced only for some determined angles. Since the various parts of the celestial body are distinguished with respect to whether they are translucent or not, or luminescent, it is not impossible that the various parts of the moon receive the light of the sun differently. End of quotation. There was an interesting long discussion in the first section of, the dial of Galileo's dialogue concerning the two chief world systems in defense of the claim, based on telescopic observations, that the surface of the moon is rough and uneven. The interlocutors compare the reflection of light from a wall with a rough surface with that from a flat mirror, and observe that the former illuminates the entirety of the surface opposite, whereas the reflection from the flat mirror only illuminates a small portion where its bright reflection fell. Next, they examine the reflection cast by a spherical mirror and decide that only a minute area of its surface would appear illuminated to the observer. The rest would remain unilluminated and therefore invisible. The whole moon would be invisible if it, were perfect, if it were a perfectly smooth spherical surface reflecting light, since that particle which, which gave the reflection would be lost by reason of its smallness and great distance. In the Assayer, published a decade earlier than the dialogue, in response to a question of, the why, of why the moon is not smooth, Galileo writes, quote, it and all the other planets are inherently dark and shine by light from the sun. Hence, they must have rough surfaces. For if they were smooth as mirrors, no reflection would reach us from them, and they would be quite invisible to us. As Ario observes, the conclusion one ought to draw is that since the medieval theory of the moon is not that light is reflected off the surface of the moon, but that the moon receives sunlight in proportion to its density, Galileo's observations of mountains on the moon, which assumes that sunlight is reflected off the moon, cannot succeed in destroying the medieval lunar theory. 
It can only be an independent account of the moon and lunar light based on radically different premises. Galileo concludes that the moon is like the Earth by claiming to see spots on the lunar surface as the shadows that mountains would cause if the light of the moon were reflected off the surface of the moon. But since the light of the moon diffuses throughout, since one does not see a simple image of the sun reflected off the moon, to assume that the light of the moon is received by reflection would be to assume that the surface of the moon is rough to assume the moon is like the Earth. So from the perspective of medieval lunar theory, Galileo's reasoning is oddly circular. The public position which Galileo occupied in Florence from 1610 involved him in controversy. As the best known advocate for Copernican astronomy, he was a lightning rod for criticism. Philosophers, for example, were concerned with the apparent violation of the principles of Aristotelian physics involved in the notion that the Earth moved or that celestial bodies were in any way like the Earth. Criticism also came from some theologians who were troubled about the relationship between Copernican astronomy and the Bible. In early 1615, well after the debate had begun, a Carmelite priest in Naples, Paolo Foscarini, published an essay in which he claimed that the Bible could be interpreted in such a way as to be consistent with Copernican astronomy. Foscarini, calling upon exegetical principles of well-known Catholic theologians such as Melchior Cano, observed, quote, that when sacred scripture attributes something to God or to any creature which, could be, which would be improper and incommensurate, then it, scripture, should be interpreted and explained either metaphorically or according to our mode of consideration, apprehension, conception, understanding, and knowing, as the Holy Spirit frequently and deliberately adopts the vulgar and common way of speaking." End of quotation. Vulgar here meaning popular. A classic example of this mode of speaking in scripture are statements about God stretching out his hand, walking in the garden, or showing emotions. All such statements must be taken metaphorically or as accommodating our limited mode of understanding of God. If the claim that the earth moves were true, a claim about one of God's creatures, it would be easy, Foscarini writes, to reconcile it with those passages of scripture which are contrary to it by saying that in those places, scripture speaks according to our mode of understanding and according to appearances and in respect to us. For thus it is that these bodies appear to be related to us and are described by the common and vulgar mode of thinking. Namely, the earth seems to stand still and to be immobile and the sun seems to revolve around it. Foscarini concludes that, quote, in matters which pertain to the natural sciences and which are discovered and are open to the investigation by human reason, sacred scripture ought not to be interpreted otherwise than according to what human reason itself establishes from natural experience and according to what is clear from innumerable data. If the heliocentric system is true, Foscarini says, we ought not to affirm emphatically that the sacred writings favor the Ptolemaic or the Aristotelian opinion and thus create a crisis for the inviolable and most august sacred writings themselves. Rather, we ought to interpret those writings in such a way as to make clear to all that their truth is in no way contrary to the arguments and experiences of the human sciences. Foscarini sent his essay to Cardinal Roberto Bellamino the learned Jesuit and important officer of the Inquisition in Rome. Bellarmino, already an old man, had spent his professional career refuting the views of Protestant theologians. Late in the 16th century, he had been named professor of controversial theology at the new Jesuit University in Rome. And he was skilled in the intricacies of biblical interpretation, as well as in challenges to the authority of the church. Cardinal Bellarmino's response to Foscarini, a copy of which the Cardinal sent to Galileo, is one of the most important documents for our analysis. In April 1615, the Cardinal writes to Foscarini, quote, First, it appears to me that you and Signore Galileo 
are proceeding prudently by limiting yourselves to speaking hypothetically and not absolutely, as I've always believed Copernicus did. For to say that by assuming the Earth moves and the Sun stands still, one saves all the appearances better than by postulating eccentrics and epicycles is to speak well. This has no danger in it, and it suffices for mathematicians. But to wish to affirm that the sun is really fixed in the center of the heavens and merely turns upon itself without traveling from east to west, and that the earth revolves very swiftly around the sun, is a very dangerous thing, likely not only to irritate all the scholastic theologians and philosophers, but also to harm our holy faith by rendering holy scripture false. End of quotation. Notice the distinction Cardinal Bellarmino draws between speaking hypothetically and speaking absolutely. To speak hypothetically in the sense the cardinal means is to save the appearances. And in astronomy, to save the appearances is to provide a consistent mathematical description of the observed phenomena. Hence, Bellarmino refers to the eccentrics and epicycles of Ptolemaic astronomy, which are mathematical constructs to describe observed movements in the heavens. To speak absolutely would be to specify what the movements in the heavens really are. This is a standard distinction employed by medieval scientists and philosophers. Aquinas, for example, observes that Ptolemaic astronomy provides only a model for observed phenomena, and that one could very well have a mathematical model in which the Earth moves. Bellarmino is wrong in thinking that Copernicus was only interested in saving the phenomena. Perhaps he is only offering pastoral advice to Galileo and Foscarini, suggesting to them a safe way to advance their arguments, only speak hypothetically. Cardinal Bellarmino next raises a theological objection, second paragraph of his letter, and I quote, second, the Cardinal writes, I say that, as you know, the Council of Trent would prohibit the expounding of scriptures contrary to the common agreement of the Holy Fathers. And if your reverence would read not only all their works, but the commentaries of modern writers on Genesis, Genesis Psalms, Ecclesiastes, and Joshua, you would find that all agree in expounding literally that the sun is in the heavens and travels swiftly around the earth, while the earth is far from the heavens and remains motionless in the center of the world. Now consider with your sense of prudence whether the church could support giving scripture a meaning contrary to the Holy Fathers and to all the Greek and Latin expositors. Nor may one reply that this question is not a matter of faith, because if it is not a matter of faith with regard to the subject matter, it is with regard to the one who has spoken. Thus that man would be just as much a heretic who denied that Abraham had two sons and Jacob twelve as one who denied the virgin birth of Christ, for both are declared by the Holy Ghost through the mouths of the prophets and the apostles. The Cardinal's reference to the decree of the fourth session of the Council of Trent, 1546, is particularly important. In addition to making clear what books constituted the canon of scripture, the council decreed that with respect, quote, to matters of faith and morals, no one is permitted to interpret the Bible contrary to that sense which Holy Mother Church, to whom it belongs to judge their true sense and meaning, has held and does hold. Nor may one interpret scripture contrary to the unanimous agreement of the church fathers. Cardinal Bellarmino extends the sense of faith and morals to include historical and scientific claims found in the Bible, since to deny the truth of what the Bible says on any matter calls into question the affirmation that the entire Bible is God's revealed word. Now, despite the Cardinal's claim that the church's understanding of the Bible was involved in the dispute about the new astronomy, he's willing to examine arguments for that astronomy. Third quotation from the Cardinal's letter to Foscarini. Third, if there were a demonstration 
that the sun is in the center of the universe and that the sun does not circle the earth, but the earth circles the sun, then one would have to proceed with great care in explaining the scriptures that appear contrary and say rather that we do not understand them than that what is demonstrated is false. But I will not believe that there is such a demonstration until it is shown to me. Nor is it the same to demonstrate that by supposing the sun to be at the center and the earth in the heaven, one can save the appearances, and to demonstrate that in truth the sun is at the center and the earth in heaven. For I believe that the first demonstration for saving appearances, the first demonstration may be available, but I have very grave doubts about the second, and in the case of doubt, one must not abandon the Holy Scripture as interpreted by the Holy Fathers. This final paragraph in Bellarmino's response to Foscarini is very important. Note that he again draws a distinction between saving the appearances and demonstrating the truth of a position. Note further that despite his very grave doubts, he admits the possibility of a demonstration for the motion of the earth although, as he says, he's aware of no such demonstration. In the absence of such a demonstration, prudence, at least, requires that the, that the traditional interpretation of those passages of the Bible which claim that the earth is motionless be maintained. Galileo shared Cardinal Bellarmino's understanding of the difference between an astronomy which saves the appearances and an astronomy which demonstrates what is truly so. In a note to a friend in 1615, Galileo observed, quote, two kinds of suppositions have been made by astronomers. Some are primary and with regard to the absolute truth in nature. Others are secondary, and these are posited imaginatively to render an account of the appearances and the movements of the stars. These latter suppositions, designed to save the appearances, are, according to Galileo, chimerical and fictive, false in nature, and introduced only for the sake of astronomical computations. Galileo described his task as the discovery, quote, of the true constitution of the universe, an understanding which, as he says, is unique, true, real, and which cannot be other than it is. Galileo, the scientist, shares with Aristotle and Aquinas and with Cardinal Bellarmino the view that science deals with the truth of things. It is important to remember that the Aristotelian notion of science that was current in the age of Galileo is different from what we generally consider science today. Scientific knowledge for Aristotle is knowledge of what is necessarily so that is, cannot be otherwise, because it is based on the discovery of the causes that make things be what they are. Such sure, certain knowledge is quite different from the product of probable or conjectural reasoning, reasoning which lacks certitude because it falls short of identifying true and proper causes. Galileo, despite his disagreements with 17th century Aristotelians, never departed from Aristotle's ideal of science as sure, certain knowledge. Whether Galileo was arguing about the movement of the earth or about laws that govern the motion of falling bodies, his goal was to achieve true scientific demonstrations. Cardinal Bellarmino exemplifies the same Aristotelian position. Namely, the natural scientist discovers the truths of nature. Thus he demands that if Galileo, the scientist, wishes to speak absolutely, he must provide a demonstration for the motion of the earth. After all, that's what a good scientist does. Without a demonstration, a scientist cannot conclude that, in fact, the earth moves. Although Cardinal Bellarmino accepted the Aristotelian notion of science, he was more than ready to reject specific conclusions in Aristotelian cosmology. When the cardinal was a young professor at Louvain in the 1570s, he embraced a biblical cosmology at odds with many of the details of Aristotle's description of the heavens. In particular, 
Bellarmino rejected Aristotle's view that the heavens were immutable and composed of special matter. In the 1570s and again in the second decade of the 17th century, Bellarmino admits that were, that were the confusion in a, that were the confusion in astronomical theories resolved by scientific truth, quote, one would have to consider a way of interpreting the scriptures which would put them in agreement with the ascertained truth, for it is certain that the true meaning of scripture cannot be in contrast with any other truth, philosophical or astronomical. End of quotation from Cardinal Bellarmino. The opposition within scientific circles in the early 17th century to claims that the earth moved was generally based on the assumption that a geocentric astronomy was an essential part of a larger Aristotelian cosmology. The view, that is, that Aristotelian physics and metaphysics depended in some way on the affirmation that the earth was immobile at the center of the universe. Thus, if one were to reject such a geocentric cosmology, then so it seemed to many, the whole of Aristotelian science would have to be discarded. As a result of such an understanding of the interdependence of astronomy, cosmology, physics, and metaphysics, the acceptance of a moving Earth would involve a radical philosophical revolution. Hence, we might understand why many of Galileo's contemporaries were so troubled by his support for Copernican astronomy. Furthermore, although we now accept without question that the Earth moves, we need to guard against assuming that it's a simple matter to reach this conclusion and that therefore the scientific opponents of Galileo were either simple-minded or stubbornly blind to the truth. An understanding of the theological dimension of the encounter between Galileo and the Inquisition requires that we keep in mind this question concerning the scientific knowledge of the motion of the earth. All sides in the controversy were committed to the Aristotelian ideal of scientific knowledge. Remember, Cardinal Bellarmino told Galileo that if there were a demonstration for the motion of the earth, then the Bible would have to be interpreted accordingly. The Cardinal has simply reaffirmed traditional Catholic teaching that the truths of science and the truths of faith cannot contradict one another. Whether we turn to Augustine in the 4th century or Aquinas in the 13th, we can discover the common Catholic commitment to the harmony between reason and revelation. Furthermore, both Augustine and Aquinas warned against using the Bible as an encyclopedia of natural science. Galileo liked to quote the remarks of Cardinal Baronius, Scripture teaches you how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. And in the next lecture, we will look at Galileo's response to Cardinal Bellarmino's letter to Foscarini and examine how what was prudential advice, that is, to avoid speaking as though Copernican astronomy were true, how that prudential advice becomes in 1616 a disciplinary order of the Inquisition according to which Galileo is required not to hold, to teach, or to defend the view that the sun is in the center of the universe and the earth moves.